Let us join our voices together in our responsive call to worship as printed in your bulletin. A field filled with treasure, the realm of God is beyond price. The yeast that makes bread rise, the realm of God brings life. A pearl of unsurpassed beauty, the realm of God is worth a lifetime of waiting. A net that catches all the fish of the sea. The realm of God catches us all. Come, let us worship the one who offers us the kingdom. Let us pray together. Triune God, may your spirit surround us in this time of worship as we step away from the world's challenges and gather as your people in to offer our prayers and our praises. Gardener God, you scatter seeds of love and grace, and we pray for your guidance to nurture those seeds into the fruit of the Spirit. We are reminded the kingdom of God brings life. The kingdom of God is a pearl of great price, and we give thanks for both the earthly and heavenly kingdoms. We give thanks, O oh God, for your compassion and your grace. And as your grateful, thankful people, we offer our prayers and praises. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn is number 288, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Please stand as you are able. <laughs> As we come to worship God, it is also a time for us to reflect upon our relationship with God. We must be honest with ourselves, honest that too often we sin turning away from God's ways. So now we offer our confession with the desire to do better, to be better, and trusting in God's abundant grace for forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us join together in our unison prayer of confession. Master gardener, weeds and wheat fill the fields of our lives, grow entangled and are difficult to distinguish. We have not spent the time we should in prayer and study of your word to help us discern what is evil and against your will. Excuse our complacency, and justify our passive faith. Deliver us from evil. We need your truth to cultivate our lives. Deliver us from evil and prepare us for the time of harvest. In Jesus' name, we ask for forgiveness and the Spirit's guidance. Amen. Gracious and loving God, hear us now as we each offer our own silent prayers of confession.
In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to our triune God. Alleluia. Amen. Let us stand for our Gloria Patri. be seated. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. God, quiet our minds, open our ears and hearts to your word, that through the reading and hearing of the scriptures, we may respond willingly to your call to, to discipleship. Amen. Our New Testament reading is Psalm chapter 78, verses one through eight, listen to God's word. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my, my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not, not hide them from our descendants. We will tell them, tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and they would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, stubborn, and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. Thank you, Kent. <coughs> we turn now to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. And if you happen to open your Bible and flip around, you will see that Chapter 13 is filled with parables, parables about God's work and people's response to God. There are seven parables in this chapter, including the parable of the sower and the four types of soil, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the yeast, the hidden treasure, the pearl of great price, as well as today's parable, which is often known as the parable of the weeds or the wheat and the tares. And Jesus had explained the parable of the sower and today's and today's parable of the wheat and the tares, he also explains, um, but the, the scripture passages are broken as far as we'll read 13, 24 through 30, and then skip to 36 to 43 for the explanation. Hear now the word of God. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed the heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, don't, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. And then continuing at verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one 
and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. And the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom and everything that causes sin and to do all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's parable isn't as familiar, perhaps, as the one which precedes it, which is the parable of the sower and the four soils. You're familiar with the story. As the sower broadcasts the seed, some of it falls on rocky soil, some of it on a path, other seed falls in amongst thorns, but some seed fell upon good soil and it sprung up and produced well. Jesus tells us the seed in that parable was the word of God. Now we can consider today's passage perhaps a sequel to that first one with a few nuances. You heard Jesus in his explanation to the disciples say that the sower of the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom, those Christians that come to know the son of man. And it is the enemy who sows that bad seed, the devil, and his seed results in the people of, the, of evil. In our story, in the parable, we know that the seed has been planted, it has taken root, it's growing well. And so no doubt the farmer was surprised when his servants notified him that growing in the midst of that field was the weed, which is known as bearded darnel, which can be translated as tares. Now, my understanding is that this plant looks so much like wheat that it isn't until the seed head develops and that the plant is almost fully mature that you can even tell the difference between wheat and this beaded darnel. And so that leads us to believe by the time the farmer got the report about this weed in his wheat, the crop was getting close to maturity. And he knew there would be a cost in trying to remove those invasive weeds even though the servants offered to go out and pull them out of the wheat field. But this bearded darnel has a tough root system. It intertwines with the wheat's roots. So pulling one out, you're likely to pull the other out. And the farmer knew this, knew the challenge of separating the two. So he says to the servants, just wait until the harvest time to separate them. Now today's farmers have lots of ways to minimize weeds in their fields from cultivation to using various types of herbicides and there are good reasons to get the weeds out keep the rows cleaner for cultivation and harvest time but a lot of it is just to not have weeds competing with the cash crop for any moisture or sun or nutrients now i'm not sure how many farmers still employ one of my dad's methods of weed control which was walking beans but during the summer, my dad, my sister, and I would spend several days walking through the field, cutting out volunteer corn, pigweed, sunflowers, anything that wasn't soybeans. It was a hot, dirty job, and we'd usually try to get to that before the beans got much more than knee high, because then it was just really difficult to walk. We look back to our first century farmer and think about him allowing the wheat and the tares to grow together knowing that there was going to be a tedious but necessary separation process of those two plants at the harvest time. For you see, the seeds of this bearded darnel can be dangerous, poisonous for people in a big enough dose. dose. It can kill a person. It can occasionally kill livestock. When people eat these seeds, that produces sort of a, a drunkenness type of state staggering and impaired speech, trembling, vision defects. The plant's biological name comes from a Latin word for drunk because that's kind of the effect it has if you eat it. And so if the two plants are milled together, it would spoil the flowers, so they have to be separated. And well, unless you were planning to add these seeds 
to make beer or bread in order to get this high that you would get from the plant. But overall, this parable gives a foreboding prophecy of the problems to come, some of which were already being felt by the disciples soon after Jesus' ascension. Jesus, throughout the scriptures, deals with the rejection of the religious leaders of his day, folks who should have been wheat, but who were more like weeds, challenging and questioning Jesus at every turn. And these troubles began soon after Jesus' ministry started. And this parable laid out for Jesus' disciples the pattern of reception and rejection that would last until the ultimate judgment and reward. Matthew's reference to the prophets of old and our old our, um, reading from Psalms pointed to the repeated pattern of hard hearts and unbelief of God's people in history up to Jesus' day. If you were to read Psalm 78 in its entirety, it recounts the history of Israel, putting it forward for the next generation. It stresses Israel's unbelief, which led to God's discipline of the people. And in spite of their frequent lapses and falling away from God, God continued to be faithful to the people, displayed his faithfulness through many acts and miracles. And even if you think about it, Jesus' inner circle of the 12 disciples, there was wheat and there was weeds. Jesus called those disciples from different backgrounds. They had a variety of temperaments. They didn't always see eye to eye. They had various ideas about who Jesus was, his Jesus' ministry, how he was going to usher in the kingdom. Consider that Peter denied Jesus and Judas betrayed him. Jesus knew and identified both, but didn't remove them from his inner circle of disciples. As Christians, we have never been of one mind always. There were and continue to be disagreements between Christians regarding practices. In the early church, first century and beyond, there were often challenges. There were false prophecies, prophets, excuse me, false doctrines. There were competing narratives about the gospel. Both Matthew and Acts refer to the children of the wicked one coming as wolves disguised in sheep's clothing. And it's sometimes hard to distinguish false doctrines from Christ's true teachings, because just like wheat and talk tares, they can look a lot alike at first, at least until they get to the harvest, when you can tell the difference between the seed heads. There are many times that we look at one another with suspicion because others don't look like us, they don't think like we do. And so we can make a quick judgment. We can judge them as weeds rather than wheat. And we can find ourselves occasionally shaking our head at the enormous gap between the way we think the world ought to be and the way that we see the world. And most of the time that difference just makes us feel overwhelmed, makes us wonder what we can do about it. But there might be other times when we're feeling especially outraged or maybe particularly brave, and we think maybe I can make a difference in the world. And so like the farmhands in the story, you volunteer to go out in the world and you're gonna rip up all the weeds that you can find. Now, we can, we can fall into thinking that we need to eliminate some of those weeds in our church or community, that those places would be better off with out those other people who are so wrong-headed or who are so argumentative or with whom we so vigorously disagree about important matters. And yet it is often fear that drives us to make these kind of judgments, to make draw boundaries, to keep people out and to keep people in. Yet Jesus says, wait. We are warned against relying on our human capacity to know the mind of God. The Apostle Paul dealt with this doctrines and false teachings a lot with his work in the different churches. In Romans 14, Paul speaks of the differences Christians may have in practice and understanding faith. Paul writes in verse 10, so why do you condemn another Christian? Why do you look down on another Christian? Remember that each of us will stand personally before the judgment seat. 
Disagreement doesn't make those who hold other positions evil, doesn't make them weeds to be crushed or destroyed or ripped out. We'd love to look out upon the world as a place filled with beautiful wheat plants without any weeds, but we know in nature and in our lives, the fields are filled with weeds. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we each are a mixture of wheat and weed, sinner and saint. There is some darkness in each of us and light in each of us as well. Scriptures teach us it is not our place to make judgments or to draw boundaries because it's so hard sometimes to tell the difference between the good and the bad. So in a world that's polarized in so many different ways, Christians have a special responsibility to bear witness to a way that doesn't include making snap judgments about others, but allows our hearts to be softened, to be broken by those who are hungry or homeless or abandoned or living in the midst of violence. Our responsibility as Christian should include loving our enemies, doing good to those who hurt us, turning the other cheek. None of that is easy. Theologian Barbara Brown Taylor says, our job is to be wheat, even in a messy field, to go on bearing witness to the one who planted us among those who seem to have been planted among, by someone else. It's always a good reason to leave the sorting to God, to God's angels, rather than for us to pull up or destroy what we perceive to be weeds. It isn't our job, it isn't our responsibility to determine who's within or beyond God's attention and love. Rather, our job is to imagine that everyone belongs to God and to embrace them as fully as we can through the love of Jesus Christ. It is God who allows a mixed field, whether we like it or not, whether we approve of it, whether we understand it, God asks us to tolerate that mixed field, both in the church and the world. And this is a call for us to awareness, for wisdom, for discernment, to listen for and lean into God's truth. There's always going to be weeds among the wheat, and there may be times when it will be called for to pull up that wheat, pull up the weeds instead of the wheat. When there is wrong doctrine being taught, or another's behavior is not aligned with the faith they profess, then discipline or separation from the community may be needed. But even then, remember that sinful actions don't eliminate the possibility of God's redemption. Think of the thief on the cross next to Jesus who was promised, today you will be with me in paradise. In a world full of wheat and weeds, perhaps the best strategy we can adopt as Christians is the strategy of the Apostle Paul, who said in Romans 12, 21, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. His is a call to reconciliation, to grace, to mercy, to love, rather than judgments about one another. Perhaps turning weeds into wheat is exactly the reason Jesus Christ came into the world, the reason that the field is mixed, the scriptures tell us anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Thanks be to our patient, faithful gardener, farmer, who waits for us as we grow and mature to bear a fruitful harvest for God's kingdom. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us stand together for our hymn of response. It's number 560. We plow the fields and scatter. <laughs>
us remain standing and say together what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us go to God in a time of prayer. <clears throat> Merciful God, you plant each of us like seeds in the field. Together we are nourished and nurtured by the sun and the rain. We sway in the wind, we are refreshed by the rains. We are blessed by the knowledge that you want us to grow towards what you call us to be. Oh God, you know us inside and out. You know us through and through. You know every word we're going to say it even before we speak. Help us to grow as your disciples, to bear good fruit. Loving God, you know the challenges of the world, the influence, influences that seek to draw your people away from you. We are challenged to live in a world that is diverse in which good and evil coexist. And we don't always understand why this is. And we know the truth of what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans. I do not understand what I do for I want, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do, I do. Oh God, help us in those times when the evil seems so strong, seems to pull us away from you. May your spirit pull us back into your embrace. We remember this day, Almighty God, those who are searching and in need of guidance. We pray that you will help us reach out to those who feel uprooted and rejected, who feel outcast, to help us help them to develop and grow in the good and in faith. We pray also this day for those who struggle with, who don't have work or don't have enough work, who face challenges in supporting and caring for their family. Make us aware, Lord, of how we can help one another, how we can hold one another with prayer and words of encouragement, as well as physical and material help. Almighty God, we pray for the earth that you have made in all of its beauty and in intricacies. May we treat it with the dignity and respect that it deserves. Care for it as you love the world and love each of us. Healing God, we lift up to you today prayers of joy as well as prayers of compassion, petitions for guidance and for healing. Oh Lord, you know our hearts before we can speak. You hear our prayers for those in the world who are suffering from hunger or violence, war or different forms of oppression. We pray that you may work in their lives through others that you might show yourself and your power to each of them. We pray also this day for those who need healing. Be with them and encourage them that they might testify to your grace and love. We pray for those who have received difficult diagnoses. We pray for doctors and nurses who will facilitate their care. We pray for those who are recovering from surgical procedures that their healing might be complete. And Almighty God, we lift up to you those in need of comfort and compassion. Empower us to comfort those who grieve. We pray for all those who've recently been impacted by weather disasters, and we ask your mercy and grace for each one. We pray, O oh God, for your church and for your disciples in every time and every place. May we be faithful to you as you are faithful to us. We thank you for this house of worship, for those who've established and planted it. They were faithful in witnessing their faith 
and in telling the next generation. May this faith community continue to testify of your love and your faithfulness to generations to come. We pray also, O oh God, for the nations and the world, for all the leaders of every level. We pray for justice that it might roll down as we seek the welfare of all God's people. We pray for our communities. We pray for the places where we worship and serve. All this we pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy worth on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In response to God's gracious action in our lives, we are called to give an offering back to God. We offer to God our whole lives, including a part of what we have, our resources. The offering box is at the rear of the sanctuary. Let us give back to serve God's purposes in our community and in the world. As God has given freely to each of us, let us return to God freely and joyfully for God's work. Let us stand together for our doxology. Let us pray. God of the ages, we offer these gifts in response to your love and grace to each of us. Use these gifts, use each of us for your purpose, that your kingdom may be enlarged. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn is number 386, O oh for a World. in Fellowship Hall for a time of refreshments, and now receive the benediction. May the love of God, the grace of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Alleluia. Amen.